Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Good morning. Our, t- today's chapel is Mr. Rick Dunham, President and CEO of Dunham Company. Rick was a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary with his THM degree in 1981. And while he was a student here, he served as executive assistant to the president. This job and its responsibilities for donor relationships jump-started his career in fundraising. He began consulting with Christian nonprofits in 1989, assisting them in their marketing and fundraising efforts. Today, he owns, he owns Dunham & Company, a global consulting group that assists nearly 50 different ministries to develop and execute biblically-based marketing and fundraising strategies. He's the author, If God Will Provide, Why Do We Need to Ask for Money? And he has been published and quoted in numerous printed and online publications. He has served as a commentary, a commentator, excuse me, on Fox Business News and has participated as a frequent guest on many regional and national radio programs. Rick has been married for 35 years, has three grown children and four grandchildren. Uh, Would you join me in welcoming Mr. Rick Dunham to our platform this morning? It is exciting to be here. I've looked forward to this, uh, coming back to see a lot of familiar faces and people that um, I hold in the highest esteem and who have put much into my life. As I think of my time at Dallas Seminary, I think of it as um, an an enormous investment of these men and women that uh, marked my life forever, and I am extremely grateful, and it's very good to be here, and great to see you, Prof. Really appreciate your ministry in my life. Uh, One correction, it's now six grandchildren. And I need to say that because my son-in-law, Clint Lyons, graduates this year from DTS, and uh, his was number five. So um, I have looked forward to this with great anticipation because of the message that God has placed on my heart. And in particular, I want to address you that will be stepping out of the doors of this place in a few weeks. I remember that feeling well, the sense of um, great anticipation of the relief of endless hours of reading and study and fi- finishing the thesis, etc. So what I'd like you to do is turn in your Bibles to Matthew 6. And before we begin, let me pray. Father, I thank you for this time together. In the midst of studies and and work and the busyness of life, it's easy to be distracted. And my prayer, Father, is that you would give us a few minutes here to be undistracted, to be able to focus on the truth of your word. Father, may your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, and Father, may your name be glorified in the next few minutes, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, It was 2 a.m. in the morning, and uh, the room was pitch black, except for a small shaft of light that came through a crack in the door. In the distance, there was uh, kind of a murmur of a conversation you could hear and some muffled beeping of some machines. Uh, As I lay there, uh, I remember thinking of just how dark that room really was. Two days earlier, I had taken a large black radioactive iodine pill, the purpose of which was to kill off any remaining cancer cells in my body. And at 2 a.m. that morning, it felt like it was doing its job. Uh, There was no pain, but the physical misery was something I had never experienced before. But perhaps more importantly, it was the isolation I felt. Darkness, isolation from human contact. I'd been quarantined for two days because I myself was radioactive at that point. In fact, the only nurse that would come in was one with a Geiger counter to see what level of radioactive I still had in my body. 
So, yeah, I thought to myself, how can this be a good thing? <laughs> but I remember, I remember laying there that night thinking, no human contact, complete isolation, darkness, and then just to begin to pray, Lord, where are you? Where are you? Because not only did I feel isolation from people, but it felt like God had just kind of disappeared. I don't know if you've ever felt that way before. But just God wasn't anywhere to be found. And then a still, small voice. Imagine, Rick, an eternity of this. And I remember thinking to myself, I, could, I can't. How could I imagine an eternity of oppressive darkness complete isolation and separation from God. And for the first time, I had just an inkling of what it was like to spend eternity without God. It also began a process in my life of looking back over the previous years and beginning to realize what how oppressive the darkness, the spiritual darkness, really is. And to begin to understand the reality of the potent nature of the spiritual forces arrayed against God's plan to reunite, to reconcile men to himself, to bring him out of that isolation. The, the message that God has placed on my heart today, in part, is for you that step out of the halls of this place, that men and women, you are marked people when you do. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy your ministry, even before it can begin. And I'm here to testify after 30 years, it's hard to believe, but 29 years ago I graduated, 30 years of looking back, I've watched man and woman, man and woman fall again and again. We have to take seriously what Paul says in Ephesians 6, that finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes or the deception of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That, my friends, is not a theological category. That is a reality. And we've, we've tended to take this idea of spiritual warfare and kind of neatly package it into another one of our theological categories, when in fact, what I've learned, it's the entire framework of our ministry. We have spiritual forces coming against us. Jesus himself said to John's disciples, the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing since the days of John the Baptist. You don't have to forcefully advance something that not that's not doesn't have something against it. And you and I need to take this very seriously, that this is an incredibly potent force. John, or, yeah, in John 17, when Jesus had his high priestly prayer, he could have prayed for a lot of things. But one of the things he prayed for was this, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. And the verb there is really keep them in your name. And it's the idea of, of build a guard around them and do it in your name. Why? This force is so potent, it takes the very name of the most potent God to protect you and me. And that's Paul's point in Ephesians 6. There was a, a, a disciple uh, that did not take this seriously. His name was Peter. And you recall the story of the Last Supper when Jesus turns to Peter and says, Peter, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. And when you come around, strengthen the brethren. The next verse, what was Peter's response? Lord, are you kidding? Are you kidding? I'll go to prison for you. I'll die for you. Uh, Peter, how did that work out for you? Not too well. Peter was in denial, and he's the one a few years later that wrote in 1 Peter 5, be on your guard. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion seeking someone to devour. He learned the lesson the hard way. 
So men and women, you're about to walk into a ministry where you're going to be marked people. And it was a few years into my ministry where I, I remember working with this incredibly talented expositor. His ministry was going national. And the evil one began to leak the lie into his life that his wife was inadequate for his needs. And he fell to infidelity. And his ministry today, it's a minor fraction of what it was and what it could be. A few years later, I was working with a pastor who um, the normal kind of church disagreement kind of um, went nuclear, if you would. And the, the evil one began to feed into this pastor the lie of self-interest. While he proclaimed that the last thing he wanted to do was divide the church, he planted a stake in the ground, and his self-interest split that church right down the middle. Another pastor I worked with, uh, again, going national, in fact, kind of the backroom conversation was, this guy is the next Chuck Swindoll, if there can be another Chuck Swindoll. But this guy was that good. The evil one began to leak the lie into his life that the most important things in life was the stuff of this world. The guy had every toy you could imagine. That ministry came tumbling down. And today, incredibly talented guy, motivational speaker to businessmen. You're marked people. But not only are you marked people, the church is marked as well. And in my opinion, it's under siege today. You look at the divorce rates, you look at uh, the level of pornography use within the church, broken marriages. But there's one malady, and this is where I want to spend the majority of, of our time and why I asked you to go to Matthew chapter 6. There's one lie that the evil one has been enormously successful in um, deceiving the church to believe as true. And that is that the most important pursuit in life is the American dream. And the greatest source of security, the most trustworthy source of security, is the stuff you can accumulate. That the, our identity and our security are in the stuff of this world. And after 30 years of working in the fundraising business, I can tell you, Satan has had a heyday with the church in America on this issue, to the point that I believe this issue alone has rendered the church impotent. And my challenge to you today as you walk out of these uh, doors in the ministry graduating class is that it would begin with you to begin to change the perception and understanding of this issue. In Matthew chapter 6, we're not going to go through the whole passage because of time, but focus first of all on verse 19. And for those of you that have your Greek text and love to read out of your Greek text, you'll notice that verse 19 begins a may with an imperative, implying stop doing this. Stop, the verb, treasuring up, treasures upon earth. Jesus knew that the inclination of the human heart is to first and foremost find its security in stuff. And therefore, he's addressing this thing directly and head on. Stop laying up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But instead, treasure up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The church in America today does not believe this passage. Can I say that again? The church in America today does not believe this passage. It believes it can have it all. That there is no sacrifice, there is no risk, 
that I can live the American dream. And oh, by the way, I can do my church thing and kind of do the spiritual exercises. I can be involved in Bible study. I can do the prayer meetings. But they don't believe this verse. They don't believe that you cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus then goes on to say, we tend to separate these, these passages, but they're not. He then says, for this reason, you can't serve God and mammon. For this reason, I say to you, stop being anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink or for what your, or, nor for what your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Go down to verse 31. Do not be anxious then saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Men and women, how do you seek first the kingdom of God? I mean, we, got, you know, we kind of lift this passage out, but how do we do it? Based on this passage, treasure up treasure in heaven. That's how you seek king, the kingdom first. You put the kingdom as a priority, not the American dream. The church in America today, and the reason why I know that this is a malady, is first of all, it's rendered impotent because it really truly is falling after the American dream and not giving it the level it should. Where I sit working with Christian ministries and churches, what I see over and over again is a lack of funding. And if you really kind of don't believe me, let me give you some statistics. If you're into statistics, you're gonna love this. The Center on Philanthropy at Indiana University is one of the most important bodies when it comes to fundraising, especially in terms of research. They have what they have a, a call as their COP panel or their, their Center on Philanthropy panel. It's a, an enormous panel of the American public, reflective of the American public. And they did a longitudinal study specifically on giving to a religion in America. And the findings were um, interesting, to say the least. Uh, Patrick Rooney, who conducted the study, is about to release a book on this, and if it's not already come to market. And I think the title of the book is something about that the tithe is a myth. It's a rarity. Okay. 10 to 20 percent of people who call themselves Christians do not even give at all. Of those that do give, they give just over 2% of their household income. So I thought, okay, well, let me look at this. Let me look at this, and uh, let me pick out a denomination that probably would have a pretty high level of giving to see if cer certainly this can't be right. Forgive me if you're Baptist, but I picked the Baptist. Okay, great teaching on tithing. I mean, they're the ones that hammer at home. The tithe belongs to the church. So they ought to be pretty good. Yeah, 35% of Baptists don't give. And of those that do give, they give 2% of household income. Hmm. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Men and women, I really do believe that this is the fundamental issue facing the church today, and the reason why is our heart will be wherever our treasure is. And we live in a capitalistic society that's driven by consumerism that as a heart is self-interest and self-consumption. And all of us, nobody's excluded from this, all of us have those messages pounded after us over and over and over again. And, the, and the, the result has been twofold. One, the underfunding of God's kingdom work. And I can tell you that is an issue. But secondly, it's the half-hearted commitment of the church to kingdom purposes today. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Let's see what God thinks about those were giving us such a small portion of their, of their uh, financial stewardship 
and who think they have all that they need. And to the, church, and to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And that's literally the translation there. NASB wanted to be a little kosher and a little PC. I want to vomit you out of my mouth. You make me sick. Why? Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, not even you, God. The church in America doesn't believe it can not, that it has to make a decision between worshiping God and mammon. And what Jesus is saying here is that if you believe that you are rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you're, you're deluded. You do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And I have to anoint your eyes that you may see. What's Jesus saying? What does it mean to buy gold? Take the money you have and put it into kingdom purposes. That's his whole point. Take the money you have. He's reflecting on what he said in, in Matthew chapter 6. Stop treasuring up the treasures here on earth and treasure up the stuff of heaven. Put your resources into stuff that's truly going to last. My fear, my fear genuinely is that the church in America today for the most part would be reflected in this passage and that it would make God sick to his stomach. But guess what? Help is on the way and it's sitting in, right out here. You men and women have a chance to completely change the paradigm, to help the church see differently about this issue of money. I have a book that I've written that's currently with an agent on, and it's called Financial Security, Discovering Financial Security in uh, Turbulent Times. And of course, it's a ruse. I'm trying to get them in to read the book so that they'll see that there's no such thing as financial security. The only trustworthy security is in God himself. So anyway, uh, part of what I say in this book is that while the church in America continues to, down this path of trying to play both sides of, of the aisle, of trying to, to say it's got a spiritual life but really not giving the way it ought to give, what I'm trying to help them understand is that the, part of the issue is that pastors in America have been unwilling to take this issue on. And that's where I'm challenging you today. You have to take this issue on. Why? Because it's dear to the heart of God. God knows that where the treasure is of his people, that's where their heart is going to be, and they're going to have a divided loyalty if they're committed to consumerism. You have to teach the whole counsel of God. I've, uh, I'm providing a, a book at cost, my first book that Dr. Bailey mentioned, If God Will Provide, Why Do We Have to Ask for Money? And it's my attempt to have a bit of a biblical theology around this issue of giving and why we need to ask for the money. And I'm doing it at cost, a couple of bucks. You can get one afterwards. My prayer is that you would become a banner bearer for this issue of stewardship. And I'm going to make some people mad. It's not about the tithe. God, do, God doesn't want us to tip 10% and to think that we can keep the 90 and do whatever we want. Biblical stewardship, if you read the text, is about 100%. It's all in. It's full commitment. And it doesn't mean that you're giving 100% to the church. What it means is you see the resources God has put into your trust as 100% his, and you're using them in every way possible for the kingdom purposes. That's biblical stewardship. You're looking for a return on the investment. And you have a chance to change that thinking. In fact, you have the chance to create a church. If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it's a passage that I've read many, many, many times, but God just, wow, whacked me over the head with it again recently when I was actually preparing for this message. He gives us two versions of the church. He gives us Laodicea, a church 
that is caught up in the materialism of its day, believing it has no need of God, and then, thank you very much, I'm fine and happy. Then he gives us the church of Macedonia. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which was given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much entreaty for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Whoa. Imagine an America filled with Macedonian churches. You know, we're in this financial crisis, and I've been doing quite a few interviews on this thing. Uh, in fact, I do one more tomorrow on Fox Business about this whole issue of the impact of, charita- on, of the crisis on charitable giving and, and overtaxation, all that kind of stuff. And a couple lessons that I think we need to learn out of this financial crisis is that uh, money is a false god that can never deliver on its promises. It is not secure. If we should learn anything from this, we should learn that. But the second thing is that my, the undermining of my financial position, I ought to be in a position enough to still give and still give in context what I would consider lavishly. See, the outpouring of a, of a heart that is fully given to God, which is his greatest desire, is they beg even in the midst of great persecution, even in the, great, in the midst of deep poverty, they beg for the opportunity to give. I don't think I've heard much of that in my career. I think it's been just the opposite. So we have the opportunity, you have the opportunity to begin to change the paradigm, to begin to create a biblical understanding of the priority that God places on the church today, especially here in America, to be freed from the spiritual stronghold and the lie of the evil one, that we can find our security in our stuff and instead make the advancement of the kingdom our priority. There's a book coming out. It's called Radical by a pastor named David Pruitt. Uh, I happened to be with the agent who's working with him last week, and he gave me an advanced copy of uh, a, a book that they're putting out with it to kind of promote it. And this is what he says, and I think it's quite applicable. There are Christian, Christians in American churches today who are rediscovering what it means to follow Jesus for who he is, not for who we have created him to be. A movement of Christians who have decided that they do not have time to play games with their lives and in the church, while billions around the globe suffer and die without Christ. A movement of Christians who are forsaking the priorities and pursuits of this world so that their lives might count in this world for the spread of the gospel and the glory of Christ. A movement of Christians who have decided that settling for casual, comfortable, complacent, business-as-usual Christianity is no longer an option. A movement of Christians who are taking Jesus at his word and sacrificing everything to declare Jesus to the world, no matter what it costs, because they believe he is worth it. My prayer is that this graduating class would be the start of a revolution in the church to begin to shift how it thinks about its priorities and to be freed from the materialism consumerism of our day and to lavishly begin to support what God is doing in the world today. Two things will happen. (laughs) We'll see millions come to Christ and we'll see a heart of a church that is fully following after our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we live in challenging times. It is so hard to find that right balance. We confess to you. 
We confess to you the potency of the lie of the evil one who can so turn in a minute way, Father, your truth. And we can wake up and all of a sudden find ourselves in a place we don't want to be. Father, our heart breaks if indeed you look at us as Laodicea. Father, we want to be like the Church of Macedonia, that regardless of our circumstances, we are lavishly pouring out our lives for one purpose and one purpose alone, on us to see you glorified and to see your kingdom advanced. So, Father, I pray your enormous favor on this graduating class. I pray, Father, that you use them through the power of your spirit to radically transform this world, that they will take the tools they have been so effectively given in their education and apply them well. And, Father, we just offer ourselves to you in complete abandonment for the sake of your name. Amen.